Great. Thanks, Bernie. And, and thanks for everyone for um, getting up early this morning. And um, I have a lot of photos and pictures and schematics. Um, so I will um, hopefully kind of share a little bit and flip the conversation slightly towards a wetlands focus today. Um, as I was telling a few folks at the beginning, um, I've changed a few slides based on our conversations yesterday. So I think it'll give us some food for thought, hopefully. Um, but just a quick intro. Um, my name is Sarah Winicky McMillan. I am an associate professor in agricultural and biological engineering here at Purdue. Um, I would kind of put myself in a bucket of an ecological engineer slash restoration ecologist because I do a lot of research on wetland and stream and floodplain restoration. So I'm gonna tie it back to some of our work a little bit later, but I've, I've just kind of chosen not to talk a lot about my own research, but um, to rather kind of focus on the topics today. But if there's interest in talking, like Bernie said, I am always really excited to talk to potential new collaborators or you know, kind of connect with old friends. So. Um, so with that, I think I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, questions, please go ahead and pop them up in the chat and I'll keep an eye on that as best I can. Okay, so I pulled a little slide from a class I teach on restoration engineering um, that really I think helps us understand how wetland ecosystems kind of tier in this connection between a lot of what we talked about yesterday related to hydrology, things like climate and basin geomorphology are the classic drivers of this physical environment that connects with what the, the wetland hydrology looks like. But I think we really talked a lot about how land use, the surrounding land use, but also within the basin, and then the flow path by which that water gets to the wetland itself being really important in terms of how the wetland um, persists over a season, how interannual variability might happen. So I would just kind of, I added this little component up here, this flow paths and component here, because land use really does drive hydrology, it affects timing, um, extents, things like that. Um, and so this surface groundwater connection, I think is really critical for not only controlling these water levels, but then also supplying things like sediment, key nutrients and potential transport of other agronomic chemicals. So as we um, focus the, the, the discussions today around wetland environments, kind of thinking about those transport mechanisms, I think is uh, an important piece of that story. Um, these wetlands are transitional ecosystems and they exist at interfaces. And so what I mean by that is they're this buffer between uplands, terrestrial landscapes, and the, the receiving water body. And that looks really, really different. And I'm gonna show you some examples throughout the agricultural Midwest, but also some other parts of the US because it's, it, doesn't just define itself as this little kind of like, you know, schematic pocket wetland that I think some uh, sometimes we, we put in our minds as like the example wetland. And so I want to talk a little bit about how, how variable they are and, and what that means then. Um, and hopefully set the stage for Rocky's discussion about how it all kind of connects to some of the ecology and the biotic response. So I'm going to stop at, I'm gonna, I can't help myself without giving you a couple element um, cycles. So, you know, it's kind of what I do, but there will be a little bit of a lead in, I think, hopefully to that biology at the end. Um, and lastly, I just want to remind us that um, these things don't operate in like hydrology affects the, so the physical environment, like the soils and the chemistry, and then that influences the biota. We have these feedbacks that happen and they're pretty important. So for example, we can have the, the vegetation creating uh, detritus and you know standing dead plant material that then can alter flow hydraulics. This decom decomposing vegetation can you know be great absorption sites for pollutants and then those can get buried in sediments and then have cascading effects on various other functions. So it's important to recognize I think that these things are all interconnected. It's not one way. So um, I tried over the years to try to find a wetland hydrology uh, schematic that I liked and I never can find one. So I edited one that I've been working on over the years last night a little bit to kind of capture some of the things we were talking about. And I think, um, you know, forgive my inability to draw a curvy arrow, but generally is um, we have these different like box and, and um, water balance tools that we use a lot. And thinking about all these flow paths about 
where water comes in, how it moves through the landscape. And these arrows here, such as, you know, this overland flow can be all kinds of different flow paths. It can be, you know, channelized, gully formation, sheet flow, etc. But in a lot of agricultural landscapes, that sheet flow can be, be quite small and, and negligible. Um, these losses through the soil and into the tiles and then out can be big drivers of, of um, nutrient inputs as well as other chemical inputs. So just trying to remind ourselves that these things are critically um, kind of interesting pieces of where water moves and if water is moving in certain, certain um, dominant flow paths for your wetland ecosystem, that's kind of a critical thing to focus on. Um, the other thing about drainage, we talked a lot about drainage yesterday, and I want to remind my, I remind, was thinking about this last night, and the biggest thing to think about too is that drainage tends to kind of, you know, depress groundwater levels. So while it's a really quick pathway for water and other associated contaminants, pollutants, nutrients, whatever, to, to wetlands and receiving water bodies, they also tend to lower groundwater tables. So if you have wetlands that are groundwater fed, that can kind of disconnect that water supply. Okay. Um, just to kind of continue on with this idea about how wetlands um, classify and how in, the, in many of our agricultural landscapes they look a little different than this typical one we might see. We have overland flow shown here and this kind of limited groundwater connection such that really we have seepage that's just going down and recharging groundwater. Um, but we also can have a lot of uh, uh, situations where we have floodplain wetlands that are getting not only overland flow and or maybe groundwater inputs from nearby fields they also might be getting pulsing from the water body next to them. So that can be as small as a two-stage ditch in an agricultural watershed, or it can be a large riverine floodplain, such as a big wetland mitigation kind of site or something like that at a larger river scale where we're kind of punching holes in levees or trying to just reconnect floodplains with their main channel. So they look very different, and it's important to understand how those different kinds of um, positions within the landscape and the influence on, of that on not only soil type, but then also vegetation and water supply, and they kind of have different cascading effects as they move through. Um, so yeah, I think I'm gonna um, stop right there and talk a little bit about how we kind of think about wetlands where we are here in, in the context of, you know, the agricultural Midwest, and then provide a couple more uh, one more context of a different location. So let me slide myself down here. And these data are from, maybe get off of that little thing. Um, this data set is here is the blue is this, um, is all the drainage land within the kind of extents that are shown here, taken from um, Jane Frankenberger and a whole host of other folks on a project called Transforming Drainage. And essentially what we're looking at is drained fields, basically where there's tile drainage. And then this over here on the right is taken from um, Daryl Schultz's work on Soil Explorer. If you've not ever paid attention to this, it's like an amazing tool. If you go to soilexplorer.net, you can search and surf around areas, not only here, but around the world and look at soil classifications, but also drainage classes. And so I think the interesting piece about wetlands is thinking about what our lands looked like before. And so you can see here that there's these gray areas that are very poorly drained. I know you can't read any of that legend, but these gray areas are those poorly drained soils. And they're really well connected to these blue kind of dots or, or great shaded areas where we have a lot of drainage. Um, similarly, if we kind of slide on down south a little bit and look at the mid-Atlantic and the southeast, we see similar patterns. So we see kind of evidence of these poorly drained soils along, you know, the Mississippi River here through um, Arkansas and Louisiana, and then this whole host of, of relatively poorly drained soils along the mid-Atlantic and southeast coast. Um, a little soft spot in my heart because this was my graduate study wetland where I worked um, as a graduate student about right there on one of those ag fields in extreme eastern North Carolina. So while a lot of the drainage questions, I think we think about the Midwest as being the classic example, there's this kind of uh, hydrology exists in multiple kinds of regions. Out in the coastal plain of the, of the southeast and mid-Atlantic, generally less tile, more ditches, but similar kinds of effects on groundwater dynamics. 
say, try to wrap this up quickly. Like I promised, I couldn't um, not have a elemental cycle figure and I wanna, and I can't find a spot to put myself without covering up the word, sorry. Um, but I wanted to, to bring this up because while all this hydrology is critically important about supply and thinking about that mass balance or the box of with inputs and outputs, um, there's a lot of feedbacks that happen between the vegetation in the wetland and what the microbes do in the sediment. So this is a, a picture from my lab working in tidal, but also in regular wet, like kind of freshwater wetlands, where we see my, you know, my group works a lot on nitrogen cycling. And so there's a lot of feedbacks, a lot of interactions between root associated bacteria and other microbial communities, between, you know, changing oxygen conditions within the sediment that really influence what's all happening and how the primary um, drivers of either nitrogen transformations or even carbon transformations happen. Um, and similarly, you know, when we think about different types of contaminants, the picture even gets more complex because now we not only have microbes doing, doing their work on using this as potential food source or things like that, and plants causing having uptake, but we also have patholysis happening, we have absorption and desorption happening. It's just really quite complicated and definitely specific to the type of um, uh, contaminant or uh, chemical you're, you're looking at. And so I have a lot of questions about how might we think about some of these cycles in, in concert. And then can we, when we think about wetlands, um, I think a lot of the discussion yesterday was creating space for not doing, you know, making sure we aren't doing harm. But what about kind of flipping it on the other side? And can we design wetlands or create opportunities for wetlands that can be restored such that we can amplify some of these processes and create opportunities for removal. So I'd like to kind of pivot to that a little bit in the context of um, monitoring briefly and then and so we can kind of understand how we might measure something like that. Um, so while um, I do play with models every now and then. My biggest uh, love is getting out in the field and doing a lot of monitoring. We talked about this a bit yesterday. But the cool thing about monitoring is that it can tell you a whole lot if you do it well, but it can also give you a lot of headaches and also be really challenging and also costly to do it right. And so the benefit is that you really get good detailed information about your site and that can then be extended to other sites as well. So I've shown kind of this like classic example. This is from a paper um, of a restored wetland in the Chesapeake Bay region. And essentially they've got kind of these different kind of drainage tiles coming in. You know, we've got V-notch weirs and things like that to be able to measure flow. And then we've got, you know, this restored wetland is letting out to a tidal wetland and there's some kind of various ways in which they're kind of holding the water back into this wetland. This particular wetland is designed for monitoring, right? There's a direct inlet point and a direct outlet. Many of our wetlands are not like that. There's many, many inlets and many outlets and they're more diffuse, particularly challenging with floodplain wetlands, which are having like a lot of different kinds of inputs. So setting up a, a monitoring program isn't always super easy. Um, and I just kind of put this point about technology because as you can see, we can get really clever about how we create um, opportunities, weirs that are built out of plywood, you know, a lot of hacked together uh, monitoring equipment from, you know, the plumbing section at Lowe's. But generally, the technology is one of the biggest things that's advancing really well and really fast. We need to know how to use it with the advent of a lot of really great sensor technology that we can get just really high, high resolution data. So it's pretty, pretty exciting. Um, okay, so um, I wanted to talk a little bit about how we um, we are doing that in our research group. I said I wasn't going to talk a lot about my own research, but I did have some cool tools that I wanted to share. Because in the context of monitoring, we often think about, let me go back real quick, this kind of setup, right? We're looking at crab samples or flow really post samples. We're not necessarily thinking about drone imagery um, or remote sensing data. And we're pivoting a little bit with collaboration with um, others in the College of Agriculture here to do UAV um, imagery. This is a wetland here um, on one of Purdue's properties. You can see it's well situated in the agricultural landscape with lots of different um, forested sections around. 
But what we're using this imagery for is trying to use it to identify um, vegetation type. Um, and then connecting the signature with the vegetation and doing some digital mapping to kind of connect that. So that's a really cool and emerging tool that we're finding pretty useful in places where it's really hard to kind of walk along the shoreline of this really complicated and very big, big wetland. <laughs> All right. Um, and then, yeah, I also wanted to then talk a little bit um, about how this monitoring can be extended and the scale dependencies by which monitoring happens, but also by which restoration might happen. Um, and as we think about wetland hydrology, it really is different depending on where you're at. So um, if anybody's familiar with North Carolina's, uh, NC State's uh, North River Farms, restoration um, project. They did a lot of work on monitoring. This was just downriver from where I did a lot of my graduate work. Um, but this monitoring setup is incredibly complex because you can imagine there's just all kinds of different float paths happening. But the scale is also really large in terms of this wetland restoration. And then thinking about how does this actively farmed area influence what's happening in the wetlands is particularly important. Um, this is a site that we work at. Um, this is a floodplain wetland along the Wabash River. And while there's not direct overland inputs of agricultural um, runoff or even tile drainage, it is situated right smack in the middle of a big um, agricultural landscape. And so we get inputs from the Wabash River as well as groundwater seepage into these wetlands continuously, especially in the springtime. Um, and so that understanding these different kinds of ways in which water moves through these, I think, is, is critically important. Um, and then I just showed another picture of a really cool restored wetland along the Great Lakes, um, along the uh, Western Lake Erie Basin. Not one that I've had the pleasure of, of walking, but also pretty great. Um, okay, I'm sorry, I can't quite get to my next slide thing. There's a... So this is my last slide, and I think it's, um, I'm hoping that I can talk a little bit um, about how um, plants and microbes and water interact under the context of restoration, and then maybe leave some questions and food for thought as we move throughout the rest of our morning. Um, when we're doing wetland, um, either rehabilitation, restoration, creation, you know, reconnecting wetlands with former ag fields, etc., we're really largely focusing on nutrients is just kind of the biggest issue that faces a lot of our, our um, water quality. Um, we're also thinking oftentimes about habitat creation. Um, but what does this mean for pesticides and other agronomic chemicals that are continually applied and utilized in many of these agricultural landscapes? So what you're seeing in this figure is kind of this transect of the before restoration where we've got maybe some levees that protect agricultural lands in the floodplain and then the upscale um, terrestrial areas. Um, and then how do we think about maybe you know, where, where is the flow pass in this system? Did we disconnect tile drains? And so now we've got this kind of um, groundwater ridging effect where we've got seepage from the hill slope coming into these wetlands from below. Maybe we have now, and that flow path might cause concentrations to look differently. Um, are there opportunities for creating synergy if we're trying to, um, maybe there's some high risk areas that we've identified from some of the modeling efforts that we heard about yesterday that restoration might make a lot of sense. And so can we maximize our impact, but also minimize ecological risk to things like endangered species or even higher order organisms? Um, and then I also, this isn't my area of expertise per se, but I think it's interesting to think about like, what are some of those barriers and how might we kind of overcome them or at least find opportunities to work together to create solutions that make sense. So that might mean regulatory connection or constraints. Um, cost is always a big issue when we're thinking about wetlands and trying to restore them and or kind of maintain their integrity. Um, and then, you know, are there stakeholders that need to be engaged in a different way than we maybe had in the past? Um, and so with that, I hope that I have, I wasn't paying quite attention to the time, Bernie, but hopefully that's, that's sufficient and um, you can take some questions if there's time. Sarah, thanks. Yes, we absolutely have time for questions. So uh, please ask questions if you've got some. Uh, 
Hey, this is, oh, sorry. Michelle, go ahead. Okay. Hi, Sarah. I enjoyed your presentation. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit or ask a little bit about the, we're in the prairie pothole region mm -hmm. in Iowa. And so when we think about wetlands, we're often looking at these kind of depressions that are located in the middle of a farm field. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, a lot of the estimates across our state say we've lost 98 to 99% yeah. of our natural wetlands um, with the installation of tile drainage. So when we think about wetlands, we're often thinking of a engineered system like a, a mm -hmm. crop wetland or else these kind of wet spots that are in our ag fields. And mm -hmm. um, so we've done a lot of analysis of these and we know that crop yield is depressed in these areas. Um, phosphorus and sediments tends to accumulate and then if there's a surface intake that can certainly be a hot spot and then if the water ponds we can see some denitrification benefits so I was just curious in the context of and maybe this question is a little bit also for um, Tripp or Chris or, or even Bernie um, you know what are we thinking about kind of these intermittent wetlands that are integrated into ag fields and um, you know, is there interest in restoration or, and I know there's very little monitoring, you know, the monitoring that we've done has been, um, you know, going out to some of the ISU research farms and there's a few other folks across the country that have done a little bit of monitoring, but I just think there's a lot of um, missing information on these systems and also some opportunity if we think about hot spots across the agricultural landscape. Yeah, I think that's a great, I had a prairie pothole slide and I was like, I, uh, I, in the essence of time, I don't know why, but took it off. Um, sorry about that. And I said, I'm kicking myself a little bit. Um, but your work and others, you're right, is like incredibly helpful in understanding these systems and their restoration and their mainly their, their ubiquitous nature but also quite temporally variable. So I don't have a good answer, but I would really love to hear what others are thinking about in terms of like, how do we monitor these things in a positive, like really, you know, good way? How do we, how do we think about them in the larger watershed context? Um, and how do we think about this last question about stakeholder engagement and economics and, and regulatory um, hurdles and or opportunities to, to try to create restoration strategies that offer these like win-win situations. You're right, they're marginal lands, they don't work all the time that well anyway, these are prime locations for us to really focus our efforts. I would 100% agree. So yeah, I'll stop talking and see if others have good inputs on that. Yes, sir, it's Pat Havens here. I think uh, we're gonna hear later this morning about some of the things you were just asking about. So public-private partnerships, yeah. um, so on. So, so you know, Lori and Scott Manley are actually gonna talk about some of those specifically. So you're foreshadowing. Well, you know, crystal balls. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a question, uh, Shara, a very interesting presentation. Um, so on this slide, on the restoration side, uh, I wonder if uh, off-site mitigation before entering into the wetland is, uh, is part of the, the, the picture. I mean, we'll be talking tomorrow about the uh, mitigation uh, with riparian buffers or grass buffers. So how does it yeah. uh, work into this uh, scheme? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I didn't, I intentionally didn't do that because of, um, I tried to not touch, step on too much of what's going on tomorrow. Um, but I think you're, you're absolutely right. Like a lot of these lines, <clears throat> excuse me, these projects, right, we're trying to create this like system. And so we've got maybe an, a riparian buffer where the tiles are disconnected, or maybe you have some sort of uh, treatment system up here. And then it's moving through, in this case, there's two different little pieces. We've got a main you know, breach, you might see this look like a smaller scale where you've got um, an traditional trapezoidal ditch in, in the Midwest, where you've got a two-stage channel and maybe some wetlands up in the, uh, on the terrestrial landscape where it's kind of flowing through, where you have these other dis um, connected systems of saturated buffers or things like that. So I think there's um, this treatment train approach, I, I think has a lot of potential. I think it has really, we can, that's where I'm thinking about these, like, how can we maybe be strategic about our restoration strategy so that we target a certain um, process 
in one location and maximize design to do that. So maybe it's an agronomic chemical. So if we think photolysis is really, really important in its degradation, so we don't have, we try to keep a relatively open canopy around a wetland that has more open water, for example, or something like that, right? So I'm sure there's a lot of ideas about how to do that. Um, but I think that's a great conversation and one that um, I wish we had more, I guess. Thank you. All right, I, I think we probably should uh, move to Rocky's presentation in, in the interest of time. So Sarah, thank you, great job. Uh, you've got us started on wetlands today, so thank you.